What are the tools and techniques today that you're most excited about? You start learning and the ability to take a pre-trained model and turn it to a new task without even having to fine tune um, to at least validate whether it's worth a deeper exploration. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful um, and underappreciated. As data scientists, we tend to lean into working on things that have quantitative notions of correctness. Mm -hmm, correct. And there are a large set of things we could build, but where we don't have those error metrics. Right. Hillary Mason, obviously uh, our esteemed guest here today. We know each other through Claudia Perlick, who was in episode number 437, one of my first episodes when I became host of Super Data Science. And I saw Claudia and Hillary together in a super popular YouTube video called uh, Computer Scientist Explains Machine Learning in Five Difficulty Levels. So it was published by Wired, and it has already 1.3 million views. And so Claudia has been a friend of mine for years, and I used that as leverage <laughs> to trick uh, Hillary into being on stage here. Um, in that video, Claudia was... Um, the expert of the five levels of difficulty that Hillary was explaining to. We also had a grad student, which was the fourth of five levels. That was Melanie Subaya. She's in episode number 559 of the podcast. A uh, great one on GPT-3. And now we have Hillary, the host of that show and <laughs> of that uh, YouTube video and countless other uh, amazing achievements, many of which we'll go over um, in this episode. Currently... Hillary, you are the co-founder and CEO of Hidden Door. So you've already raised $2 million in venture capital from the likes of Makers Fund, Betaworks, Brooklyn Bridge Ventures, Homebrew, and individuals like the CTO of Roblox. <laughs> Hopefully I say that right. You did. Um, and uh, you've described Hidden Door as Roblox meets Dungeons & Dragons with an AI dungeon master. So do you want to fill us in on Hidden Door? I'm very happy to. And first, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thanks to our audience uh, for lingering and participating in this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm the co-founder of Hidden Door, and we are building a machine for playing any story in any world. So imagine being able to take a novel or a TV show or a movie that you're in love with, um, and imagine your own characters and the adventures they might have with your friends um, wow. in those worlds and to build those worlds together. So it becomes a collaboration between whoever created that initial world, you and your friends as you create characters and build your own stories and adventures, and then the machine that is facilitating and co-creating along with you. Wow. Um, yes. That sounds like a tricky <laughs> machine learning problem. Um, and so you're leveraging um, what your marketing materials, at least, describe as a new kind of narrative AI. So how does machine learning assist with creativity in this hidden door platform? How does it allow your AI dungeon master to create new adventures every time? So I'm actually going to take a step back in answering that question and talk a little bit about what the goal of the experience is, because I don't know that everybody here is a big tabletop RPG fan. So actually, let me <laughs> ask, for those of you who are here in the audience, uh, how many of you have played tabletop RPGs such as Dungeons & Dragons? We have a handful of folks. Yeah, we've got and probably the, a third of hands went up. Yeah, and, and of the <laughs> folks who have not played, how many of you are familiar with the idea of what it is? So we've got, okay. Pretty much everyone else, but I'm just going to say, for those of you who are not familiar with the idea, um, you sit around a table, whether it's real or virtual, with your friends and tell a story in a world where you have a character, you make decisions for that character, and then another player, um, who's usually called the game master, the game guide, sort of mediates and forces the rules, applies the laws of physics, and tells you what happens next and sets up the story arc for you. So we're trying to create this kind of experience, but in any world, whether it is, you know, the Bridgerton world or whether it's like a, uh, you know, unnamed wizard boy having wizard boy <laughs> adventures world, right? Whatever it is that you happen to be in love with, or it's the classic fantasy setting. Um, and so when we think about what that experience is, it is one of being able to take a story world, that world building, to take the set of tropes uh, to distinguish what makes that world unique from those tropes 
and then to express it in a way that is consistent um, and that gives you the room to tell your own story within it. Wow. Um, and so that's the sort of experience we're trying to create. And it's one that currently um, you can really only have by playing with a person who plays the role of the storyteller. Right. Um, and every group is different. Um, but this sort of uh, this sort of experience is one where it's um, it's a social experience. So you're you end up telling a story you could not tell alone. Um, and you couldn't tell without your particular set of friends and your particular, you know, uh, game leader. Um, so back to the technology. So when we think about the technology to make this possible, um, it is only in the last few years that we have been able to use large language models in a way to facilitate this sort of storytelling, though we are probably not using them in the way you might think, um, because that would lead to uh, bad things um, or problems. Um, but it's, when you think about what those systems are able to provide conceptually, they are able to essentially encode the patterns of a large amount of communication. So essentially, they're trope machines. Right. Um, and when you apply them to, say, a classic fantasy genre or classic science fiction genre, you can start to pull out the tropes that distinguish that genre and that subgenre. We've done a, a, actually a ton of cool data visualization of the subgenres and how they relate through language use and trope overlap um, to try and understand these things. So we are um, using a extremely pragmatic mix of emergent uh, language model techniques, a bunch of procedural techniques, a bunch of classic NLP techniques, um, all architected around creating a controllable and safe experience. We also have a simulation and a game engine inside our, our system, um, which means that you get things that you think are reasonable. Uh, it has memory. Um, you have uh, like a character sheet and statistics behind the scenes as well, even if everything is expressed in language. So said another way, the core problem we're solving is one of taking unstructured language of a novel or a story, structuring it, mediating it through a simulation or a game engine, and then using that structured representation to generate both text and art dynamically. Wow, the so, art as well. The art as well. So wow. as you play, it comes to life as a graphic novel wow. um, that is created uh, based on what you and your friends choose to do. Cool. So the kind of the natural language generation has us thinking maybe about transformer architectures. Yeah. Uh, Ton of, tons of that stuff. Um, <laughs> but I'll also say most of that is running offline. So we are not doing that stuff uh, in real time for a bunch of reasons, primarily controllability and safety. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so um, how do you build, how do you conceive building these kinds of machine learning models or even these products? Um, I imagine you're taking advantage of a lot of natural language data, mm -hmm. lots of stories. And then how do you transform that into a playable product when there's no quantitative error function to optimize? So I know you've described that to me personally, that this kind of the way that you've set up these machine learning models, there's no cost function that you're minimizing, say, um, or an objective function that you're maximizing. Um, so how do you frame your machine learning models and, and the product around without that kind of cost function that probably most of us are used to? So I actually, I'm going to make what may be a provocative statement um, and say that uh, as data scientists, we tend to lean into working on things that have quantitative notions of correctness. Mm -hmm. Correct. And there are a large set of things we could build, but where we don't have those error metrics. Right. And there are a ton of products that are incredibly valuable that exist today where we are using machine learning or data in a way where... We don't have those things, and they are all around us. They are even things like uh, web search as a canonical example of something where, uh. yeah, right? You know, you're going to say, oh, of course there are quantitative ways we do this, but they're kind of crappy, right? <laughs> they don't really solve the problem of given this, you know, global set of documents, which is the absolute right one for this query, for this person in this context at this time, okay. right? And so... I'm going to say that our problem here is not unique and that uh, if we're, you know, thinking as a room full of data-oriented people about the kinds of problems we even think about solving, 
Um, I often find that uh, there are unexplored opportunities in these problems that are messy because they don't have some pure notion of correctness. Um, so that's my controversial statement, and I can't tell. I think everyone's very grumpy now. So <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how this one goes yeah, there's over. There's some thumbs up there in the crowd. Maybe, maybe. So, so then we have from to the, ask. From the bioinformaticians. <laughs> I know that that's the bioinformatician section of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're way in the back, so they must be cool, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so we have to ask questions. Uh, when we think about building products, about how we know that a product is good, like what is the experience we're trying to create? How do people react to that? Can we decompose our technical, our, quant our problems into things that do have notions of correctness? Can we right. test our approaches against subsets of our data where we can you know, look at it, we can rank things, we can know what we can expect? Um, like there are ways to approach that, but I think um, as a data person, it requires accepting that there is no one right quantitative answer. Um, and then really thinking about the product experience you're trying to create and how you're going to have people, in our case, play test the thing. Uh -huh. um, and just to give some more concrete examples of what we're doing at Hidden Door, like we have a system that is telling stories, that is deciding, you know, what might happen next. And sometimes it comes up with stuff that is completely expected, but it's if it does too much of that, it's boring. Right. Sometimes it comes up with stuff that is bizarre as heck, right? <laughs> but if it does too much of that, it's just a weird machine that does bizarre stuff. It's not fun. And so how do we come to this notion of fun? Like it's a mix of the boring and the, the unexpected. And so we do indeed have a formula for the mix we are trying to optimize for. Right. Um, but it is, uh, it is not something that is purely quantitative and you know we just sort of have to accept that and work it into the the product development and design process. So you can you can stop me if I'm on the wrong track here but it sounds like sometimes even though ultimately the product the experience that we're trying to deliver doesn't have something quantitative we could still break the problem into parts where we can have quantifiable objective functions that we can train with gradient descent um, Sometimes. And then we can use things like uh, A-B testing and multi-arm bandit testing when you have a sufficiently large audience of people, which we do not because we have not released our thing yet. So, <laughs> um, so that's a bit of a trick. Nice. Yeah, that'll be fun. Eliminating unnecessary distractions is one of the central principles of my lifestyle. As such, I only subscribe to a handful of email newsletters those that provide a massive signal-to-noise ratio. One of the very few that meet my strict criterion is the Data Science Insider. If you weren't aware of it already, the Data Science Insider is a 100% free newsletter that the Super Data Science team creates and sends out every Friday. We pour over all of the news and identify the most important breakthroughs in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. The top five, simply five news items. The top five items are handpicked, the items that we're confident will be most relevant to your personal and professional growth. Each of the five articles is summarized into a standardized, easy to read format, and then packed gently into a single email. This means that you don't have to go and read the whole article, you can read our summary and be up to speed on the latest and greatest data innovations in no time at all. That said, if any items do particularly tickle your fancy, then you can click through and read the full article. This is what I do. I skim the Data Science Insider newsletter every week. Those items that are relevant to me, I read the summary in full. And if that signals to me that I should be digging into the full original piece, for example, to pour over figures, equations, code, or experimental methodology, I click through and dig deep. So. If you'd like to get the best signal-to-noise ratio out there in data science, machine learning, and AI news, subscribe to the Data Science Insider, which is completely free and no strings attached, at superdatascience.com slash DSI. That's superdatascience.com slash DSI. And now, let's return to our amazing episode. Awesome. And then, so you've mentioned a couple of times how you need to be careful to not have not just boring outputs or too bizarre of outputs, but also just inappropriate Absolutely. outputs. So ones either that don't make sense or actually contain 
content that is, yeah, explicit or, um, or you know, otherwise undesirable. Mm-hmm. And so there might be that kind of language in the training data set, or it might just happen by accident. Mm-hmm. So what kinds of safeguards do you put into place with a product like this to ensure that anyone who uses it, uses it including the children who use it, don't get exposed um, to these nonsense or, or inappropriate outputs? Yeah, and I think it's worth saying explicitly to you that all of the pre-trained large language models are trained off, you know, all the language they can find on the internet and then some, Reddit. right? And Reddit, <laughs> and so it is full of crap, and yeah. that crap gets magnified, and it is very easy to evoke that crap without trying, um, and that is not good, um, and there is no, <laughs> right. you know, I, I'm fairly comfortable saying there is no way to fix it. Like you can do a lot to try and prune the training data, um, but it it doesn't solve the problem. And so then we think about, okay, you know, if we have this thing that can, uh, let's say, generate a bunch of useful stuff, um, but we can never put that in front of a human being, much less, you know, a teenager or somebody, you know, who's 10 years old, right? Um, What do we build around that system so that we are always monitoring it? And then how do we use it in an architecture such that we're able to use it to create a product, but with a fairly high level of confidence in what the product can output? So in our particular case, um, we do all of our generation of language offline, Uh templatize it, and then Uh um, only fill those templates with words that come out of a dictionary that we have um, handed we have yeah. vetted, curated, and it's a dictionary that is itself derived from data, but um, at least there's been a set of eyes on it. And now, of course, templates can get filled with combinations of words that can be problematic in that combination, and so you also can classify things um, you know, against uh, known problematic language. Um, and then there are issues, well, this also, um, I think it, at one point, In the introduction, Jared mentioned I've been around for a long time, right? So (laughs) we've actually done language generation stuff for a very long time. I worked on it extensively in 2014. This is how we did it then before we had transformers. We had these other generative models, right? So it is not a novel approach. It's just sort of going back to our roots and uh, now combining things where we may end up with um, tens of thousands of candidate sentences uh, generated um, that are now templatized that can then be used uh, in a production environment. It also has the side effect from a, a data you know, practitioner point of view of turning what is an open-ended generation problem with no notion of what correct or goodness looks like into a ranking problem where we can indeed have a notion of what correct and good can look like, which makes me as a data scientist very happy. I like (laughs) ranking problems. Um, They're a lot easier to solve than uh, than open-ended generation problems, and it also gives us a lot of control over what the output of the system is. Now, that control comes at a sacrifice of generalizability. So if you start to ask our system things like who won the World Series in 1995, we are not going to have a template pre-generated for that. That's not something that exists in the world that we've built our content around, um, and so it won't work. So you do have some trade-offs there. That makes sense. I I wouldn't expect to go into Hidden Door and asking those. I, I wouldn't expect that to work as a user so I think that that's a, a fair trade-off uh, for this use case. So you mentioned that you've been around in data science for a long time. So I hear it. <laughs> and uh, so in 2010, before I had heard of the term data science, um, you coined a term that I first learned from Jeroen Janssens, who's right here in the audience. So he was in episode number 531 of the Super Data Science Podcast. And he pointed out to me in that episode this awesome data science process that you coined with Chris Wiggins in 2010 before I or probably most of the people in the audience here had heard of data science. So what is the awesome O-S-E-M-N data science process? And maybe let's just start with that. And then I've got a follow-up question for you. Okay. So um, this is, I mean, as you've already said, it's an abuse of language because... um, (laughs) I like the word awesome a little bit too much, but, um, (laughs) so obtain, scrub, Um, explore, explain, explain, (laughs) model, interpret. Oh, it's explore. Uh, it's explore. explore. You're reading on his fact check. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I wrote it down. Um, and what this was, was, uh, you know, it actually wasn't that long ago. 
And I'm sure this seems completely obvious to everybody in this room that you get some data, you clean it up, uh, you look at it, you interpret it, model it, and then you visualize it or, or communicate it in some way. Like that's what it was. But in 2010, that was not obvious. Right. And we wrote it down because <laughs> we, or at least, you know, I kept finding myself in a room where, and this is one of the things I love about the data community. People come from all kinds of different backgrounds to data. Like some folks come from biostats and some folks like me come from computer science and some people come from physics. And, you know, we probably have some economists in the room and I don't even know where everybody else comes from, but it's probably <laughs> incredibly awesome. And we end up, uh, you know, trying to solve a problem together, doing the same thing, but using different language or different processes and procedures. And this just kept happening. Um, and so finally we wrote it down and said, we're going to say, this is the, the process. This is what you do when you are data sciencing. Um, and it is really funny to talk about it here today <laughs> because now you look at it and you think, oh, this is so obvious. Like, of course, but it wasn't obvious in 2010. Yeah, it's, it's super cool how things like that, writing that down 12 years ago, how that has been absorbed by the data science community. Um, and it's helped to provide a backbone for people to understand what they might be doing on a regular basis. Um, and, and then it makes it into things like Jeroen's book, Data Science at the Command Line. And yeah, it's just, it's such a wonderful, um, open community that I love being a part of. So, uh, so we know now the five stages of the awesome process, obtain, scrub, explore, model, and interpret. That's an N. <laughs> well, thing. It's an abuse. <laughs> um, and so 12 years later, is there a particular stage of those five stages that data scientists struggle with the most still today? I'm going to say that that last one um, ended up being a stand-in for a lot of things mm. and that um, data science work is sometimes work, you know, to make so that you understand something. Sometimes it's work to communicate to somebody else so they understand something, they make better decisions. Sometimes we're building systems that go into production for machines to make decisions or to automate processes. And we just sort of elide at all of that, like the what happens next part. Right. And I think that's become one of the harder things um, is doing the first four steps without or with all of those different contexts in mind. Um, Great so answer. I'm going to say that. <laughs> nice. And, and the tooling for all the rest of it has gotten so much better. Um, like the, uh, it's so much friendlier and so much easier to start to play with so many things and so many techniques that were uh, very difficult even 12 years ago. What but, are the tools and techniques today that you're most excited about? That is a good question. <laughs> um, it's a yeah, big one. Or just it is one. a big question. One. Okay. I'm going to say that the thing I'm most excited about is probably the thing that I think gets overlooked um, in machine learning these days, but I think is tremendously powerful, which is few shot learning. Oh, yeah. um, like everyone is excited about uh, generative models or about being able to generate images from, from, you know, various input or from text prompts or adversarial networks. But I think few shot learning and the ability to take a pre-trained model and turn it to a new task without even having to fine tune um, to at least validate whether it's worth a deeper exploration, um, I think that's incredibly powerful um, and underappreciated. And it's something that these big natural language transformer models are trying to specialize more and more in, um, as well as deep reinforcement learning approaches and it seems like these kinds of things, being able to do few shot learning is key to having machine learning be a lot more like human learning because people can, even children can often learn what to do in a circumstance from one example. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the big uh, deep learning models that we have today might require millions of examples um, in order to be able to understand something that a child can learn in one or two. That's right. So it it allows us to approach problems that were previously inaccessible because we just didn't have these large clean data sets. Um, 
And I also think it allows us as data practitioners to play with using a model in a particular, to approach a particular problem in a way that lets us understand if it's worth doing something uh, more in depth in that domain. Um, and I am a huge fan of tooling changes and algorithmic changes that take something that used to be really hard and make it really easy because I think then we just start to play. And that's, uh, that's where a lot of great work ends up coming from. That's a lot of what you were doing at Fast Forward Labs, I imagine. That's, I built a whole company <laughs> around the idea yeah. of playing with, uh, with new things and emerging things, so it is true. Yeah. Um, so now that you are the CEO of Hidden Door, um, do you get to spend much time getting into the code and into the data? <laughs> What's it like day to day as the CEO of an emerging tech company? Uh, it's, um, I will make an admission that I probably shouldn't, which is that, yes, I still write code. Um, <laughs> and that is bad. And I should probably not be doing that. Extracurricular. Um, well, so I'm leading our engineering team and uh, and do write some of the code myself. Um, if you look at my GitHub profile, you will see exactly when we've been fundraising because it is when I'm not <laughs> writing code. Um, but no, my my job right now is really split in three chunks. One of which I'll call CEOing, um, which is sort of all of the operational work of you know, having the vision for the company and making sure that we are moving towards it, that we are building the right team. So hiring is a big part of that. Um, we are fundraising as necessary um, and have the resources to keep everything moving forward. Um, second is engineering leadership. So recruiting, managing, and reviewing a lot of pull requests and making sure that, uh, you know, wow. the, uh, the team is as productive as possible. Um, and then the third piece is doing uh, some small technical contributions myself. Um, and that will, of course, evolve as the company evolves, too. That's, That's my cool. day to day. And we're all remote. Um, so it is uh, I'm based here in Brooklyn. So a lot of uh, spending time in interesting places in Brooklyn, too. So you're all remote, but um, because you're based in Brooklyn, you get to sometimes meet up with other people who are based in Brooklyn? Uh, well, yes. I have one, one team member who's based in New York um, and then folks uh, from the West Coast to Western Europe. Um, but we do get our whole team together every three to four months somewhere that is accessible to everybody, that is relatively cheap, um, where we can cook <laughs> together and where there's amazing food and something memorable to do. Because if there's not something memorable to do, I have to be memorable, and that is a problem. <laughs> so it is much better to go somewhere interesting. So we just went to Lisbon. Um, we went to New Orleans before that. Um, so we've uh, we've gone to some really nice nice spots. That sounds like a great management strategy tip for all of the uh, the founders or engineering leaders out there? Well, if you are, you know, in a world where you're not paying for an office, then we have a little bit of leeway to pay because you still need to build that trust, right? Yeah. Um, you still need to get to know people and you just don't have that casually when you're not in the same space or even in the same city. So you have to create that time. Um, and it is really fun to do it in, in nice places. Yeah, I bet. Those sound like great locations. Yeah, I personally have never been a fan of the uh, the Zoom coffees or the Zoom happy hours. I think that they're a drag. They are a um, drag. And it's very hard to get that, you know, insight into, like, um, when I first met up with some of my colleagues, like, I didn't know if they were vegetarian or not. Like, you right. just don't get right. that sort of casual insight into, you know, what they're like, you know, other than, than around the work. So right. it's really, uh, really important to create that space. Yeah, we do, uh, we do a similar thing to you in getting the engineering team together. Uh, they're flying everyone into New York. Now that you mention it, I don't know why we're doing that. I guess it's because we do have office space still in New York, but it sounds like we should be going to Lisbon next. Yes. <laughs> um, and it is certainly... It's incredible. Uh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> and uh, Sean on my team is in the audience here, and he'll probably agree that uh, when we actually all get together, it is some of the most valuable time, and it's uh, great productivity Mm -hmm. um, so we use it for planning tickets in the upcoming sprints and a lot of detail. So being all together around a whiteboard, how are we going to architect these things? How really is this going to work? How's it going to look? How are we going to do that efficiently? Figure that all out and then separate it into tickets. And then everyone goes off to wherever they're from. And we can uh, work on those tickets uh, in misery alone <laughs> until the next time we can all get together. 
I feel like I have to say we, we do a lot of that. <laughs> we try to carve out some of our hardest problems and then work as a group through how we want to approach them and then get to the point where we can like scope it out into individual work. But that's that's actually less important than the rest than the, of yeah, just getting to see out. people and know them a bit. That sounds great. Um, so I noticed on the Hidden Door uh, careers page that you are hiring right now. You're hiring software engineers. Yes. And something that I mention on the show constantly, regular listeners of Super Data Science um, will be aware that I'm constantly saying, even if you're a data scientist, you should be picking up software engineering, software engineering school uh, skills as often as you can because every single guest on the show is always hiring software engineers. They're not always hiring data scientists, but they're always hiring software engineers. So the more software engineering skills you have, the more hireable you will be and the more desirable you will be. Um, so you're hiring software engineers right now. What do you look for in the people that you hire? So let's say we are helping people who can help us build this product. So <laughs> people who can build production code, even if they come from a data science background, uh, and we want to see them. And what I look for in the people I'm hiring uh, into these engineering roles is first uh, good judgment. Because, again, we are not always in the same room. Nobody's micromanaging you. Mm -hmm. I need to trust that you can take a piece of a, a product, you can understand the experience we're trying to create with it, where it's going to interact with other pieces of systems, the trade-offs that need to be made. And some of our stuff is quite quirky, too, in terms of its infrastructure requirements, like sometimes GPUs or weird memory or whatever it may be, um, and that you're going to make good decisions quickly that get us to something that works. And I look for folks who are open-minded and collaborative. Um, because again, this is you know about having a team where everyone brings whatever expertise they may be bringing to the team, but we are able to work together and move. And again, we're an early stage company. We have a product going into alpha in four weeks. Um, we need to move quickly, um, but also build things that are robust, that are maintainable, where we can build systems, we can build on top of those systems, and we can trust them. Um, and so it is really good judgment. Um, and then being somebody who is uh, collegial, who is open-minded, who is uh, willing to, you know, not always be right or, you know, um, has the agility to think through, you know, one of the interview questions I like to ask if I can give it away, um, and I ask this of data scientists too, <laughs> is, you know, let me give you a problem that we're working on. Uh, yep. something real, and then yep. tell me how you might want to approach it. What yep. do you think? And usually the answer I get is something that's going to be like, you know, a six-month, two-year-long effort. Mm. I say, great, that seems like the right way to approach it. Now tell me how you're going to do it in four weeks. <laughs> and then they give that answer, and I'm like, okay, cool, you have one week. What are you going to do? Like, cool, we've got by the end of the day, the two of us, what are we going to do together to, like, get something in place. Wow. Um, and so really look for that sort of uh, agility and thinking. Um, because you should always build that stupid thing first anyway. So you always have something to compare to as you, uh, you explore different approaches. I love that. I do something similar with the beginning of that. And I don't mind giving it away is the interview question that I ask because mm -hmm. the problem is always going to be different. It's going to be whatever I'm banging my head against the wall most at the time that you come to interview with me. <laughs> um, but then I've never thought about that. This second part, this testing the agility of how you can you know, shorten that time span and make it more challenging. Well, it's That's also cool. the, the kinds of people who thrive in a, a very early company and a product where you do have to think about a bunch of different systems at the same time and things are moving quickly and you might build something and then realize like, oh, we have to evolve it in a certain way um, versus the kinds of people who are coming into a mature product. Like some people are much happier in that space where they can go deep on one corner of it. Um, that's a different skill set than what we're looking for. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's just uh, what could, makes you happy. Yeah, that kind of skill set could be great in a big tech company with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. But um, yeah, you need agility in a small, early stage company. I also, since I have the luxury of thinking of building a team, I think a lot about um, like how much optimism versus pragmatism we have on our team because you need people who are optimistic enough to like come up with those ideas and want to go after them. Right. You need people who are pragmatic to say, oh, and the, this is going to be a problem for all of these reasons. But you can't just be all pragmatist because then, you know, you'll never do anything risky and you can't be all optimist because you'll never ship. So it's really trying to balance that sort of uh, uh, approach um, as well across the team. And then I also really believe that everyone should bring some different 
background as well. So I'm not looking right. for a bunch of folks who like, or software engineers at Google to all come work together. Like maybe we have space for one of those, but like people who come from a variety of different, grew up technically in different ways, um, who have seen a lot of different things, who can bring that wisdom. Cool. So can write production code, come from different backgrounds, have good judgment, are open-minded and collaborative, and have a good balance of pragmatism and optimism. Yeah. Cool things to look for in software engineers and how you could get hired <laughs> at Hidden Door, <laughs> which sounds like an amazing company to be working at. Obviously. Oh, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. And okay. we eat really good food. Um, that sounds like the best perk. Um, so I'm going to have my last question before we go out to the audience to ask audience questions. Lots of sharp people out there, so I hope they have brilliant questions prepared. But my last question, going back to the beginning, okay. I talked about how um, I knew I could leverage Claudia uh, to try to get you to be on Super Data Science because of this super popular uh, computer scientist explains machine learning in five difficulty levels, uh, this wired video with over a million views. And um, we, I mentioned how Claudia was the level five uh, person. She was the expert. Melanie Subaya was level four. Level one was a child. And so you had to explain machine learning to a child. And for anybody out there in the audience who would, I, the reason why I watched the video initially was so that I could have more ideas of how to better explain what I do for a living to uh, people that are non-technical. And then it was uh, this bonus treat at the end that I was like, oh, I know one of these people. Um, and so thinking about that child, the level one person, in the coming decades, these trends that have been happening over the past decades will continue. So things like exponentially cheaper compute, uh, exponentially cheaper data storage, more and more people working in data science and computer science who can share information in real time via archive papers and open source code. So these are the kinds of driving forces behind the AI revolution that is just starting to take off and that is going to dramatically transform our lives in ways that probably we can't even imagine today. So Hillary, big question, but for a child today, what are you most excited about what AI could do for them in their lifetime? Yeah, I love this question. Um, and I always love these, uh, getting to speculate about what the future may bring. Um, I really do believe that uh, we're in a moment of incredible technical progress, certainly in some of the aspects of machine learning. We are just at the beginning of figuring out how to make it useful and what those products are actually going to look like and how we build them in a way um, that actually supports us as people. Um, and the framing I like to think about is that these are things that are able to, in many cases, reduce cognitive drudgery, but they are not themselves creative or intelligent. And so I like to think about ways we might use AI and machine learning to support our creativity, to support us in accessing information at the right moment when we have to make a decision. Um, to augment what we're able to know and understand when we need to understand it. Um, and that is just understanding that these systems are really great at ingesting a huge amount of data, representing it some way, and then we're sort of getting better at having it come out the other end in a useful way. Um, but I can imagine that for that, you know, that kid who was, she was so cute. By the way, she, she really wants is. to be a spy, an <laughs> AI spy. Um, like, that's just awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, as she's growing up, thinking about using AI and machine learning to ease a lot of the stuff that we end up doing by hand, um, and that might even be as mundane as scheduling, or if you think about, like, right now when I communicate with you, it might be in text or in email or in Slack or on Twitter or LinkedIn, or, like, it could be in any of these places, and right now I have to manually go and search each one if I don't happen to remember, right? So just ways of organizing and accessing information we care about so that we make better decisions. Um, and then, you know, going back a bit to what we're working on at Hidden Door, I'm very excited about these tools as one of um, helping us be more creative together. Um, so not being creative itself, because I don't think these systems are. They're just really great at representing patterns and tropes. But having those tropes made useful to us at the moment when we want to play off them or we have a different idea, 
um, where we're the ones in control and guiding. Um, and we can give it a little bit of input and see where it goes and then say no more like that. Um, like I think we'll see a ton of products making use of, uh, of the tech in those ways over the next decade or so. Super cool. I'm very excited about it. I love that answer. And it's nice to be able to tie it back to what you're doing at Hidden Door today. All right. So let's open it up to some audience questions. Um, wow. Yeah, we've got a few already. All right. So asthma can be busy up here. Is that Tom? Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hi, John. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, thanks so much for coming. I, I thought I, I, I'm not a person who play, has ever played Dungeon and Dragons or anything like that, but this entire idea is really fascinating to me, so I think it's really cool. So my question for you is, obviously, um, the, the, the space of like novels, books, TV shows, movies is, is very large. Is the thought that the user will sort of be able to upload and, and do sort of pick what, whatever they want. Um, and, and additionally, sort of related to that, um, obviously a, a novel, like a hundred page novel is a, a different amount of data. It's to, it's different than like a, maybe like a, a hundred episode TV show. Right. How, how do you, how do, how do you work with, with such sort of different data types? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so I'm going to say that, uh, our vision is that creators will bring their novel or TV script or whatever it may be. Um, and then the fans will be playing in that world. So even if you don't play, you know, these games yourself, you can think of it almost as like a fanfic engine. Um, and then we do a ton of work to analyze text and pull out the characters, locations, the items, the kinds of plots, the personalities. Um, and so when I speak with authors, one of the things they ask is like, how much do you need to make it work? The answer is actually a very small amount, but whatever we get is augmented by, um, we ask our authors to give us a recipe of the mix of subgenres they're drawing from and then use those tropes as a starting point. So the more that exists, the, the you know, more it may feel like a distinctive, unique world. But then as people play in that world, they start to develop it themselves and they create new locations along with the system um, that are of the world consistent with it, but something that's new to them and their friends. Um, and so that's more or less how we're, we're approaching that. Of course, more is better, but also um, you can actually get pretty far with even a short story um, if it is detailed. Awesome. Great question, Tom Bliss. Thank you. Hi, Hillary. Hi, John. Uh, Hillary, big fan. Um, really, thank what's, you for... What's your name? Oh, my name is Gary. Hi, uh, Gary. Uh, hi. Um, I really uh, thank you for the uh, the video on YouTube because I think I contribute at least 20 views to the 1.3 million <laughs> view. It really awesome. helped me to learn how to explain uh, what is machine learning to my non-technical coworker. Uh, but still many people and maybe people who work in specific industries like in education or in uh, public sector still think machine learning is a scary thing. So how do you think we as data people can um, advocate for the trust in machine learning or, or leveraging AI? So I think we have to make it boring again. Like, um, I, again, I've, I've been around at least 12 years, right? And, uh, and when I started working in machine learning, which was more like 20 years ago, it was not cool. OK, um, it was the kind of thing where like the cute boys at grad school parties would like turn and walk away, um, <laughs> like did not work out so well. But um, no, and I, I really do think that we need to show what it does for us and give people an intuition for like, this is the information that goes in and this is sort of what we're doing to it. You don't have to get into all the details and this is what comes out the other end and how it's useful. Um, such that we're not saying it's an AI, but rather it's a thing that's useful and we're focusing on that versus focusing on the technology itself. Um, and I do think that we happen to be hopefully coming out of a moment of extreme hype um, in both directions. So like, you know, AI is changing the world and everything is AI, but on the other hand, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and that's not to say that it's not and we shouldn't be very you know, wise about where we put automation. Um, but I, I do think we are hopefully getting into a moment where we can start to focus on how the technology is useful and what it can let us understand and do, and not on the technology as a scary thing itself or as something that's leading to like, you know, general, 
AI, like generalized AI or, mm-hmm. or actually intelligent machines because that's a bit of a boogeyman. Something that's surprising like, to me is how almost everyone who isn't in the industry thinks that we either already have or are really on the cusp of artificial general intelligence. Yes. <laughs> it's really interesting, that disconnect. I mean, there's that, and then uh, I'll say this also because we're here in New York. That's a bit of a West Coast thing, too, a bit of a meme for some folks. Um. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Frederick. I'm a big fan of tabletop RPGs, so this concept sounds really interesting. Uh, of course, the story is just like a part of playing these games, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the underlying mechanics and like game design that goes into Hidden Door? I can, um, and so uh, I'll tell you also, since we're talking a little bit about the experience of building the company too, that um, my co-founder and I built our first prototype of this idea. We raised a little bit of money, and the very first person we hired was a game designer. Um, because getting those mechanics and that experience right is really important. Um, and it's not my experience. Since, like, I've been a, a lifelong player, not a, not a designer. Um, and so we happen to have someone on our team named Chris Foster who designed, uh, worked in design on the Rock Band games and on the Lord of the Rings mm. online and sort of brings um, that game design uh, sensibility and expertise to what we're able to do, um, you know, with machine learning in this kind of system. And so I will say that we are not really innovating on the mechanics in that it is more or less what you expect. We have a very simple stats-based system. Um, There are sort of skill-based challenges in in the game, but what we are doing is keeping most of that behind um, a veil of language so that you see when you attempt a challenge, whether it succeeds or fails or critical succeeds or critically fails, and you see what the consequences are and why. Um, but we're not, uh, this is not a like stats optimization kind of RPG. Um, we've tried to be really thoughtful about giving, um, as much robustness to the stats and the progression system as necessary to motivate through story, um, and through the, whatever kind of story it may be, whether it's a comedy or a, you know, a more serious story or a gritty one. Um, but that's actually been one of our biggest uh, design questions is sort of how we want to approach that. And also, I'll say in, in one of the fun things about this project has been building a team that comes half from game design, traditional game design, and half from uh, machine learning, too, and trying to get everyone to speak the same language and actually uh, work together to create that experience. Uh, so thank you for the question. And we do a lot of playtesting to see if we're, we're hitting it well or not. Um, and it may change a lot this year. Nice. I think we might have one more in-person question here, but we also have at least one virtual question, which uh, Jared Landry can provide to us. Jai Jeffries asks, uh, what about licensing and clearance of intellectual property? Um, yes. So we are working with some very nice IP lawyers and doing all of that <laughs> above board. It is a good question. Cool. And a clear answer. All right. Sean Kosla. Hi, John and Hillary. Um, <laughs> Hillary, you mentioned earlier you called lang- language models basically trope machines, I think. And you mentioned finding overlapping tropes in genres and subgenres. I'm curious how you've fine tuned models to basically parse out tropes from a piece of text. Yeah, it, it's really, um, we look at it in a few different ways. So, one is in the language overlap. Um, so, really, just what words are being used and how are those words associated with each other. Um, We also look at uh, plot at the level of sort of subject, verb, object on the sentence by sentence basis. So we, um, this may not be interesting to anybody else, but have a a particular set of sort of plot actions that our game simulation understands. We model those uh, that, uh, let's say, an arbitrary story into that that vocabulary and look at the progressions. We can build sequence predictors on that sort of stuff Um, and then look for basically clusters and we also cheat outrageously. So we have a set of um, essentially uh, subgenres that we are interested in and have pulled a bunch of data for um, where those subgenres did not emerge from the data where we and some authors we work with sort of wrote them down. And then we look at those things and how they're different and whether it's statistically interesting. Um, and again, I'll say this is all in the context of building a particular game. 
Um, so it may or may not be useful to anyone, but I, I do have some cool visualizations I can put on Twitter later if, uh, if folks are interested in seeing it. Excellent. I'll try to make sure that we get those into the podcast show notes awesome. as well. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for the great audience questions, the virtual ones, the in-person ones. Now we get to my final questions that I always ask. So Hillary, do you have a book recommendation for us? Oh, you know, I have so many. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. And I'm going to pick that one um, for a bunch of reasons. One is that I think it is the kind of book that should be a playable game. Um, if you haven't read it, it is very fun, very lighthearted. Um, and in fact, in the end notes of the book, he talks a lot about going into the pandemic and getting very depressed and then writing this book just to have fun again. So like I had a lot of empathy for that. Um, and it is one of sort of taking also a bunch of tech tropes and then going in to, without giving much away to a different world and seeing how people who sort of come out of our tech community do in that world, which I thought was hilarious. So I'm going to say uh, we should all read something on the beach this summer that is a little bit fun and lighthearted. Nice. That um, sounds good, Hillary. And maybe it's a good counterpoint to the tomes of data books Jared has been giving away at this <laughs> event all day. Um, super recommendation. I'm looking forward to that fun beach time with that book. It sounds great. And so then, Hillary, my last question that I always ask. You've had like five last questions. <laughs> so I had my last question before we went <laughs> to the audience questions. Uh -huh. But then my two standard ones that we always have at the end of the show the book recommendation you've done, and then how to follow you. So uh, you have a massive Twitter following already. Um, so presumably Twitter is the spot anywhere else that people should be. Yeah, so H. Mason on Twitter. Um, you can follow Hidden Door by signing up at hiddendoor.co, and we are going um, into a closed alpha in about four weeks. So if that's something you'd want to give us feedback on, we'd love to have you participate, and particularly any... Uh, you know, teenagers who love uh, <laughs> stories as well. Um, yeah, I'm a little boring on Twitter these days, but that's probably the best place. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Hillary, for Thank being you. both experiencing the R conference as an interviewee in this discussion, as well as being on the Super Data Science Podcast. Really appreciate your time. It was amazing as I would expect to be. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up with you again sometime in the future. This is awesome. Thank you. And thank you all. For those of you listeners who were able to join us in New York for this live filmed episode of the Super Data Science Podcast at the R Conference, it was awesome to meet you and chat about your favorite aspects of the show. A live audience certainly makes shooting an episode more fun and exhilarating. We'll have to do it again soon. While shooting live might be intimidating for some, it was a breeze for the data science legend, Hillary Mason, from whom we all learned a lot. In today's episode, Hillary filled us in on how we can build products with no quantitative function to optimize by breaking it into lots of separate machine learning problems that themselves have differentiable cost functions. She talked about how we can ensure narrative AI systems do not output nonsense or inappropriate outputs by creating output templates and carrying out offline vetting of dictionaries. She talked about how few-shot learning is the machine learning technique she's particularly excited about. She filled us in on her awesome data science process, obtain, scrub, explore, model, and interpret, and how the final step, interpretation, is the one that data scientists still struggle with today. And finally, Hillary told us how she hopes that AI will transform our lives in the coming decades by automating cognitive drudgery, thereby augmenting human intelligence. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Hillary's Twitter profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 589. That's superdatascience.com slash 589. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Yvonne at Seabird, Mario Pombo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogveng, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another pioneering episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks. 
and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.